trust you're all uh, okay today. Amen. I want to invite everyone to open up their Bibles. We sang about the Word of God going forth, and uh, today we're going to look in His Word, the Bible. That's where God's Word is going forth today. We're going to start a sermon series on the book of 1 John. 1 John is a book of the fundamentals of the faith, the Christian faith. Today we will be looking at a biblical view of Jesus Christ and found in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And I trust as we study and, and read through the book of 1 John that we'll find anchorage for our faith as we once again regain a, a firm grasp on the apostolic faith. John was the last apostle that lived. He's the only apostle that wasn't martyred as the others were executed for their faith. John the Elder writes this letter, perhaps from the city of Ephesus, perhaps in 90 to 95 AD, some 60 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But John has such a vivid memory, and he recounts the life, the ministry, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as if it was still fresh in his mind. And he stands as a bastion of truth for his generation and all generations to follow. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that your word in these last days has gone forth. You spoke through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, as we look into the person, the life, the ministry of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that our roots might dig deeper as we meditate on these truths and as we anchor ourselves in your most holy word, in our, in our most holy faith, Lord, that we would find rest for our souls and that we would find stability to carry on and to be light bearers of Christ. This I pray in his name. Amen. So if you could turn with me to the epistle of 1 John, and we'll be looking at the first four verses today, which speak of the biblical view of Jesus Christ. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation because that's the version we, we carry in stock so people can follow along as well. We do have some Bibles there on the table. John writes, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself, was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. The aged Apostle John never derailed from the truth he had received. The Apostle John never turned away from the Lord who had called him earlier in his life from his father's 
fishing business. Jesus recruited fishers of men. And John and his brother James leaving behind the family business to follow Jesus Christ as a young man never forgot the impression that Jesus Christ had left on his life in the three years they lived together and shared the kingdom of God intimately as Jesus revealed the Father to John the Apostle. Note first that John is proclaiming to us, or to you, the one who existed from the beginning. John the Apostle who wrote the Gospel of John, that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, tells us that Jesus existed in the beginning. Speaking of the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ, not merely one born of the Virgin Mary with his origin there in the city or the town of Bethlehem, but one who was with God in the beginning, in the beginning of recorded time and history, as we see in John chapter 1, verse 1, the same Apostle John wrote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And notice that in Genesis 1, 1, we hear of the origin of creation in which the Word is present in creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. Then God said, Let there be light. And so Jesus is there speaking the Word, the Logos, the creative power of God, speaking creation into existence. John never detracts that Jesus was fully God. But here, Jesus also presents to us that he who is truly God in the beginning is also one who was truly human. Note in verse 1, the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We, the disciples of Jesus Christ, we, his twelve apostles, we, those who walked with him three years, we have walked with him, we have lived our lives fully abandoned to his leadership. We have seen him commit miracle after miracle, raising the dead, healing the blind, walking upon water, casting out demons, declaring the kingdom of God with authority, teaching as one who had authority. We have seen his many healings. We have seen the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus created from nothing. We have seen and traveled with him. We have witnessed him become weary, where he slept in the boat, where he was thirsty at the well, where he ate with us. We have seen his ministry, how he was the sinless son of God, one who committed no evil, one who didn't sin against the Father. G John would write in his testimony that Jesus was full of grace and unfailing truth. This is the one who proceeded from the Father. But John said that Jesus dwelt amongst them as a man. We see in John chapter 1, verse 14, that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. Yes, Jesus was the eternal Son of God from the beginning. And Jesus was in the flesh a man, fully man. 
John goes on to say in verse 1 that he saw him with his own eyes. John is an apostle. An apostle of Jesus Christ is one who has seen the risen Lord, who has experienced direct communication with Jesus. The apostles were alive during Jesus' ministry, with the exception of Paul, who was called after Jesus had risen, one born of untimely birth, whereas the other apostles were alive during their ministry of Jesus Christ. John saw him with his own eyes. He saw the transfiguration where Jesus shone like the sun and he was transfigured. When Jesus led them up a mountain, John was privileged to see Jesus' glory. He saw him transfigured. He saw him shining like the noonday sun. John felt Jesus as he reclined his head on his breast at the table where they ate the supper together. John wrote of Jesus saying that he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we know from the scriptures that the inner circle or Jesus' closest disciples were James, Peter, and yes, John. In fact, when Jesus was on the beach after he descended, he told John that if it was, he told Peter rather, that if it was his will that John would be alive when he returned, what would it be to Peter? <coughs> Signifying that the apostle John would live out his days as an old man. And so John is writing this letter now with vivid memories, with his mind still sharp and recollecting the truths. He is an elder of the church. He is an apostle of Christ. He is an eyewitness to these things. And he writes with clarity. He proclaims the truth that Jesus is both the eternal Son of God and the Son of Man. John says that he touched him with his own hands. This is no mere phantom recollection or phantom dream or vision that John had. This actually happened. He saw Jesus walk on the water. Jesus came into the boat. Maybe he was dripping with water. And John, shivering, may have put his hand on his Lord and, and, and was amazed to see his Lord in the ship. This is the same John, the apostle, who reclined on Jesus at the Last Supper. John says he is the word of life. Not he merely spoke the word of life. Not he has the way to the word of life. But John says he is the word of life. John affirms that Jesus is the very gate of salvation. Jesus is the very bread of that comes down from heaven. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Good Shepherd. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, predicting that Jesus would give himself up. John would have been present when Jesus taught on the kingdom of God. John would have heard the words of life that Jesus spoke, that in him was the life. And if you ate his flesh and drank his blood, you would have eternal life. John would have witnessed the power of Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead, as well as the young girl. John was present when Jesus conquered death and rose again the third day. In him was the life. John wrote in the book of John that Jesus was full of truth and unfailing love, proceeding from the Father. 
John knew that Jesus was the life. Go with me to John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. John writes in his gospel, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with the physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but from a birth that comes from God. John credited Jesus as the life giver. In the book of Colossians, elsewhere in scripture, and we saw in Genesis 1, that Jesus is also the creator of life. For in the book of Colossians, it says that all things that were created, whether seen or unseen, were created by him and for him. Not only is Jesus the creator and sustainer of life, but Jesus is the life giver of spiritual life. For the kingdom of God, as we studied, is the kingdom of, of, of God that is entered through Jesus Christ. Go with me also to the first John chapter 5 verse 12 as we notice that Jesus has the authority now to give life. John, 1 John chapter 5 verse 12 John says whoever has the Son has the life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have the life. John wants to make the church perfectly clear in his day as well as ours that the life that is from God is through the Son of God, through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is identifying the person of Jesus Christ as the pillar, the foundation, the cornerstone, the source of life for the church. And that there is life in no other name. In the book of Acts, we are told there is no other name given unto men under heaven by which you must call upon to be saved. Life came through the Son, and to this day, life comes to the, through the Son. The Bible is clear that the, the life that comes from God is given through the Son of Christ, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The life is in Him. Verse 2 says, This one, who is life itself, Jesus Christ, he is the life. He is the one who proceeds from the Father. He is the very image of God. Jesus has said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. This is who is life itself. John says he was revealed to us and we have seen him. John is not changing his message in his old age. He holds to the truth that in Jesus Christ is life. And John is a witness of his miracles and of his ministry and of his death and of his burial and of his resurrection. And John is a witness for his Lord whom he loves. He says, And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. John has one message for the world at large. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To receive him who was begotten of the Father. True God from true God. The exact image of God in the flesh. Jesus Christ who is eternal life. Jesus says that he gives life 
to all who come to him. And anyone who calls upon his name will be saved. Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. The Apostle John speaks of the same message, the same revelation that his peers received as well. Verse 15 of first chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. His contemporary Paul writes, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. The good news that God came in the flesh. The good news that he would lay down his life for those who would believe on him, that they may have eternal life by believing in him. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. John was standing firm in his faith. He didn't change his message. He didn't recant his testimony. He remembered what his eyes and his ears and his hands saw and felt. And so he spoke with authority as one who had seen the Lord. Verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 15 says, It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message. It is the good news that Christ came in the flesh and bore our sins upon the tree. John is testifying here today that this is the anchor of Christianity. This is the pillar on which the church hangs its, its, its foundation. For it says that no other foundation can be laid other than that which was laid by Christ Jesus and his apostles. And Jesus is the, the chief cornerstone Peter, or Jesus had asked his disciples, Whom do you say that I am? Peter made a great confession. He says, You are the Christ. And on, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, On this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. John is testifying of this very truth, that in him, was eternal life. In verse 2, John says, He was with the Father, and then He was revealed to us. Speaking of Jesus' pre-incarnate deity, Jesus was Lord before the virgin birth. Jesus took on flesh, for nothing will be too difficult for God. With God, all things are possible. He existed in the beginning, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, where the perhaps the unknown writer of Hebrews, if I could turn there for a minute, in speaking of Jesus Christ, writes this, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Jesus, John's ancestors, the Jewish nation. And now in these final days, these days where John was living, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. Notice Jesus' pre-existence prior to the incarnation. Not merely one born as we are in, in, a, in a finite sense with a beginning, but rather one who is infinite. Jesus in the book of Revelation says, as he writes to the churches, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There was never a time where Jesus did not exist. There was never a time 
when Jesus was created like the angelic realm or the human realm or the animal realm. In the six day creation of Genesis, God is speaking for creation with his mighty power. Jesus is present, creating the universe. Verse 3 of Hebrews 1 says, The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. Of course, John saw the life of Jesus, and John also saw the ministry of Jesus. Let us go back to our text found in 1 John chapter 1. He writes, He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. Jesus was born to Virgin Mary. And the Magi followed the star, the sign, and they found him. And the shepherds ho heard the angelic chorus, and they followed the direction, and they went to worship. And Simeon in the temple also prophesied, and the prophet, prophetess Anna saw the, new, the king of the Jews come into the temple. And Elizabeth, full of the Holy Spirit, recognized the Christ child, in the womb of Mary. And when John saw Jesus coming on the horizon where he was baptizing in the Jordan, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descending upon him as a dove. And he heard a voice from heaven saying, This is the, my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he later testified that the one who had sent him to baptize told him, When you see the heavens open, and the Spirit come down upon him as a dove, then you'll know that it's him. John saw him with his own eyes, and he came down to the earth, and he walked our earth, and he lived with us. John, in verse 3, proclaims, he proclaims what he or we ourselves have actually seen and heard. He is an unashamed witness. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes. John spoke of the truth. He said, he, he speaks, he testifies of the truth. Jesus says, anyone who hears the truth hears his word. John heard Jesus. And he believed. So now he proclaims. The Gospels are a testimony from the, the contemporaries of Jesus' day. They are eyewitnesses. We give credit to them for giving us an account of the historical Jesus. The biblical Jesus is a historical Jesus. A Jesus who lived in who, 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 who was Jesus of Nazareth, who was the carpenter's stepson, who was the son of Mary, who at the age of 30 began his earthly ministry, who was baptized, who chose 12 disciples, of, amongst whom John was one of his inner circle. John is testifying to these things. He proclaims that he himself have, has, had actually seen and heard. Why does he do this? Why does John need to share this news? Is it not enough for him to believe and his apostles? No. He says he, that we, or that you may have fellowship with us. John has been born into this family of God, and he recognizes that the life is in, in the Son, Jesus Christ. And he wants many more brethren, many more brothers and sisters to be adopted into the family, to be given new life in Christ. He wants the fellowship of those who are saved, those who have the Son, those who've experienced rebirth, those who've experienced salvation, the very salvation 
that he describes as Jesus Christ. And John wants us, you and I, to have fellowship with him and the other believers of his day. Verse 3 said, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so you may have fellowship with us. The glory of fellowship is to be partakers in the common salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus. The half-brother of Jesus, Jude, hoped to write about this in his epistle. He said, I, I hope to write about the common salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. This common salvation was preached by the Apostle John. He said, and our fellowship, our koinonia, our way of life, the, sal the common salvation that we share, this is our communal belonging. This is what we belong to. Our fellowship is with the Father. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. How can we worship one that we've not known? John says, there's one who came, the representation of the Father. He revealed the Father to us. He is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ who came forth from the Father. He revealed the Father to us that we might know the Father. That we might have fellowship with the Father. John says that you may have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father. This God is not an unknown God. He's revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. When Paul went to Athens in his missionary journey, there was a statue named to the unknown God because they were polytheists. They had gods for all manner of things, gods of the roads, gods of fertility, gods of war, gods of creation, gods of the sea, gods, gods of every type, and they had an unknown God. Paul said, let me reveal to you this God who is the unknown God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. The same thing that John said, the one who was present at creation, the one through whom all things were created. Our fellowship is with the Father. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father, for Jesus came forth from the Father. Verse 4, verse 3 says, Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, his Son, Jesus Christ. In, 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 the, in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, this this speaks of, of, of Jesus' legitimacy as the, 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 the very one who, who is begotten of the Father. He is, he, him and the Father are one. He is the representation of the Father. In the book of Colossians, let's turn there, if you will. Book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Listen, friends, we're told in our Bibles that God is a jealous God. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me, for I am a jealous God, the first commandment. And look at this in Colossians 1, verse 15. He is supreme over all creation. Supreme means he has the place of preeminence. He's first. Jesus can't, the, the apostles can't make a claim about Jesus being supreme unless he is God the Son. Otherwise, they would be breaking the first commandment of the Pentateuch, we, or the, the Decalogue. We looked at that last week in, in, in Exodus chapter 20. For through him, God created everything. Notice that the Father and the Son are working in unison, in cooperation. This is why in Christianity, 
we say that God is three and one. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 16 of Colossians 1, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities of the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Verse 17, he existed before anything else. The preeminent Christ and holds all creation together. But note here in verse 18, the very intimate relationship that Christ has with Apostle John and with all those who believe during this dispensation called the church age. Verse 18 says, Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. John wants you and I to have fellowship within this body of believers who have believed upon the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to have koinonia, in that we share this common salvation, this common eternal life, that we may live eternally in the spirit man, and also that we may live eternally in the resurrection. Let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again. Note that this is the life that never ends. We see here in verse 35, But someone may ask, How will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies do they have? We go to verse 40. In verse 45, 1 Corinthians 40, 45. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life giving spirit. Jesus came to impart to us spiritual life. The scripture teaches that in Adam, all die because of original sin. We die in the flesh physically because of original sin. And we die spiritually because of that sin. But notice that in Christ, we're given spiritual life. When, verse 46, what comes first is the natural body, that is to say, we're alive, physically, but we're dead spiritually. In Christ, we're given spiritual life. It says in verse 46, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like earthly man, and heavenly people are like heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. Praise be to God. We serve a living Jesus. We serve a resurrected Jesus. And John will testify to this, that we serve a living God. And he gives us a living hope that our fellowship in the here and now is one that continues forever because the God that we serve is a spirit and our fellowship is with his son. Look with me, if you will, to verse 4. We are writing these things so that you may share our joy. Notice the intent of John. He's not merely satisfied with his own salvation experience. He wants us as well to be satisfied with our own salvation experience. In the scriptures, it talks about something called revelry. Revelry is, a, is when people get excited about things, but it's often spoken about negative things like pagan revelry or idolatrous revelry. But this is joy. This is a fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says that one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. And in His presence is fullness of joy. That's why when we come, for example, to the Lord's table and we partake of the bread and the wine and we commune with our Lord Jesus Christ, we're partaking in the joy. The joy 
that was set before Jesus at his triumphant resurrection. Yes, we proclaim his death. We're coming up on the, the Easter season in our in the Christendom calendar. And in the Christian calendar, first we must come to the dark road of Calvary on Good Friday when Christ was crucified. But we come to the triumph of Easter morning, resurrection morning, when Christ came back to life, when Christ resurrected. And so our joy may be complete because John is testifying of the true Jesus, the biblical Jesus, the Jesus who lived and walked and ministered with him, but also the Jesus who died for his sins and rose on the third day. And I close with this familiar passage from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that is Christ incarnate, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So I invite you, brothers and sisters, I invite those who have not yet believed on the Son of God to repent, turn away from your sins, turn away from your unbelief, turn away from your revelry, and believe on the Son of Man, Jesus, who lived and breathed and died, and on the Son of God, one and the same, who had the authority to lay his life down and who had the authority to take it up again. All praise to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in the church and with the Old Testament saints now and forever. Amen.